Prayer is a mighty, life-changing force. Yes? Yes. I can remember once when a driver hit a friend's daughter with his car and how the community in which we lived at the time surrounded this family in prayer. I think this might have been one of the few times in my life that I remember witnessing a miracle firsthand. It was remarkable to watch God heal this young person from injuries that could have so easily taken her life. Have you ever been the recipient of prayer from an entire community before? It's a powerful experience, whether you're on the receiving or on the giving end. You can also remember See You at the Poll events. Does anyone else remember those? During my middle school years, these meant so much to me as a young Christian. Discovering other young believers and standing with them to pray was an answer to prayer in many ways itself. And I've so enjoyed getting to know and to pray with the prayer group here at Wesley. They're known as the power of prayer group. This is a group of dedicated believers who storm heaven's gates each week on your behalf. Did you know that, that they pray for you? Those orange cards you turn in, they pray over those every week. If that's not reason enough to use those new attendance prayer cards, I don't know what is. <laughs> Congregation, how blessed are we that we get to be in direct communication with our God. But for all the answered prayers and all the wonderful prayer experiences I've had in my lifetime, I've also had some really significant prayer letdowns. I can remember instances when I prayed and I prayed, and yet an answer never came. I can remember times when words to pray were hard to find, and other times when my prayers swirled around a cacophony of thoughts in my head. I can think of frequent occasions when I've prayed for people I love and less frequent occasions when I've prayed for those I don't care for so much. Which I think brings me to my first point this morning. That is, that God calls us to pray for everyone as is exhibited in Paul's first words this morning in the scripture passage that we have from 1 Timothy. And so I invite you now, if you'd like to join me, in hearing these words from 1 Timothy chapter 2. They'll be on the screen, they're in your bulletin, but that wonderful red-bound Bible in your pew loves to be read every now and again. And if you care to join me there, it's on page 196. Let's hear these words together. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all who are in high positions, so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. This is right and is acceptable in the sight of our Savior, who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, there is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus, himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all. This was attested at the right time. For this I was appointed a herald and an apostle. For I am telling the truth, I am not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles, in faith and truth. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Have you ever prayed for someone you didn't really like? Nobody? Okay, good. Not as often as you should. At least, at least we're being honest with each other. That's me too. I have. But sometimes I think it's one of the most awkward encounters we can have with God. 
if we're being honest. For me, it's usually preceded by some not-so-nice thought that I've just had about said person, which immediately prompts me to pray something along the lines of, Lord, forgive me, for they're just human too. I most often say this prayer when someone turns into the wrong lane of traffic. Oh. Or when certain politicians open their mouths for longer than they probably should. In all honesty, Paul's call to prayer for everyone in this passage has long confused me. How is it that that Paul expects me to pray for those who've hurt me? Or how am I to offer up prayers for those who bring harm to others? And what about those politicians that annoy me? Am I really supposed to pray for even them? Well, yes, I believe Paul would say that I am. We are supposed to pray for all people, even those who brought difficulty into our lives. Paul makes his point clear when he encourages us to pray for kings and all who are in high positions, rulers in first century Ephesus who may have found this difficult to pray for. You see, while the Ephesian people were not yet part of the Roman Empire at the time that Paul wrote this letter to Timothy, For them, the idea of dictatorial rulers would have hardly been foreign. So if Paul knew that the Ephesian people were used to the effects of absolutist power, why on earth would he have encouraged them to pray for those who held such sway over their lives? Well, as I learned this week, some scholars believe it has something to do with a precedent that was established far earlier in Israel's history during Israel's first exile period. Paul would have been familiar with the tradition that encouraged believers to pray for those whose land they were now forced to occupy, as he was a learned Jew, well-versed in the teachings of the Hebrew Bible. Jeremiah 29, 7 reads, But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile, and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. When you think about it, there is wisdom in praying for your leaders, even those with whom you have strong disagreement. Not only because it's the right thing to do to pray for all people, we just get that that's the right thing to do, I think, but but also because when our leaders make decisions that are blessed by God, it is us, the people, who also benefit from that blessing. Now, this may seem a bit self-serving to some, but I find it to be quite practical, and frankly, it was a necessary view for the early church to take. You see, in this era, believers had to be subservient to the powers of the day, who often were revered as religious deities. But worshiping these leaders would have been impossible for these early believers as it would have been for you and I, as their loyalty was to their one true God. So by encouraging the earliest Christians in Ephesus to pray for their leaders, Paul may have been teaching them to do everything in their power to acknowledge their politicians while also providing them the opportunity to worship God. Now, if you recall, Paul's direction to the early church in Ephesus was to pray for all people, leaders being just an example of those for whom they should offer prayer. But do you remember why Paul said to do that? to pray for all people. Let's reread the first couple of verses of this morning's passage again. First of all then, Paul says, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all who are in high positions, so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. What an odd reason so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. I don't know about you, but there are many prayers I pray that make me want to do anything but keep quiet. For example, I really struggle knowing what to do with the pervasiveness of gun violence in our country over the last several years. Certainly, I pray for those who've been affected by the many terrible tragedies that are becoming all too frequent in our society. 
But if the goal of my prayer is to bring me to silence, I'm not sure that prayer is the right thing to do here. Similarly, I often feel helpless when it comes to issues of climate change, a topic that is probably going to affect my generation and my children's generation far more than it will many of the people in this room. My prayers range from, Lord, forgive us, for we know not what we do, to, Lord, when will we wake up to the fact that we're causing real harm to our planet? But again, I, I don't want my prayers to be nothing more than a kind of passive resistance, lulling me into a false sense of peace and security. What is prayer for if that's all it accomplishes? Congregation, I'm convinced that either Paul had something very specific in mind here, or he was dead wrong. So what did he mean when he said we should pray for everyone so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life? Well, fortunately, we have some context in the verses that follow. Starting with verse 4, Paul tells Timothy that God desires salvation for everyone, that God wants everyone to come to knowledge of the truth. Clearly, Paul's aim in writing this letter to Timothy is to encourage his mission of reaching the people of Ephesus for Jesus. And this makes sense because, as with any of Paul's writings, the most important goal is always to reach people for Jesus. But how does quiet and peaceable factor into the church's mission for, for making disciples? Well, from my reading this week, it appears that scholars wrestle with this even today, and they have since this verse was first written. But it seems like most of them agree on one interpretation, and that is that these two words that Paul was instructing Timothy to use were some sort of cultural value, a value of tranquility in this early period of the church. It was very common place in this time period and in this region, and it was Paul's goal to appeal to the Ephesian people in order to get them to put their faith in Jesus. Essentially, Paul was instructing Timothy to say to the people, pray for everyone, including your leaders, so that you may know how to come to the one who can bring true peace to this world. The call to live quietly and peaceably was most likely an evangelistic tool that Paul was encouraging Timothy to use to reach the people of Ephesus, who would have placed high value on these things. And I feel like I can get on board with that. After all, isn't it our mission as well to make disciples of all people? But still, that explanation doesn't stop me from wondering how many would have read this passage before and would have felt compelled to keep something they're praying about but want to share to themselves. So that's where I want to draw to a close today. Brothers and sisters, I encourage you to pray for all people, especially those with whom you disagree, those you maybe think are unworthy of prayer or those you believe to be different from you. But I implore you, don't let your prayers come to the end in your head or in your heart. James 2.18 reads, But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I by my works will show you my faith. You see, our faith is not exercised through prayer alone. It is important and necessary to spend time with God in prayer, yes. But it is equally important to live out our faith in such a way that we're actually actively seeking what we've prayed for. One example of this is when we offer our thoughts and prayers to those who are grieving. Of course, it's right to think about and to pray for those who grieve. But how much more meaningful would it be if we could work to help those who grieve during their grief? Or how about my earlier examples of gun violence and climate change? It is right to pray about these things. But what if my prayers led me to action? 
instead of just leaving me wondering why God hasn't solved these issues yet? What if God intends for me to be the answer to the prayers that I have been praying all along? What if my heart is supposed to be transformed by prayer so that I go into the world to make the difference that I seek? People of faith, we are God's hands and feet in this world. We are the agents that God uses to bring about his kingdom. And so I wonder, what if we chose to live prayerfully, seeking to pray for everyone and every situation, but then also being prepared to listen for how God might use us to answer those prayers? So I encourage you this week, just give it a try for a few days, to add some time of intentional listening to your prayers, if you don't already. I would even invite you to jot down what thoughts you have while you pray throughout the week. And then after you're done, and you've done this for a few days, look over what you've written down. Are there any patterns that emerge? Whose name appears multiple times? What situation keeps popping up? You see, God may be trying to invite you to be a part of answering someone's prayer. And that's where your active faith takes over. I like how Pastor Sarah said it last week in her sermon, live by the book. Perhaps this week, living prayerfully is really more about how we live than how we pray. Perhaps living prayerfully is more about what we do than what we say. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have given us this great opportunity to come to you in prayer regularly, as often as we want even. Thank you for this great gift to talk with you, to listen to you, to spend time with you. But Lord, this morning we pray that our time with you wouldn't just be passive, that instead our time with you would transform us to be active participants in this world, to be the type of people who hear our own prayers and hear the prayers of others and then go out in the world to be your hands and feet, to be the type of people who answer prayers. God, we love you. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen.